All right, um, if you have your Bibles tonight, we've been preaching through the book of, teaching through the book of Genesis. And last week, if you remember, we started uh, the stories about Joseph, and I said that was like the last part of the book of Genesis. Uh, but there's, there was a parenthesis that I don't want to pass over in those stories. In, cha- in chapter 37 of Genesis, we read about how Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, how he was hated by his brothers because he was a dreamer, and God gave him dreams of things that were to come, and uh, he, uh, he shared these dreams with his, with his brothers, and his brothers weren't too happy because the dreams, God basically told them that all his brothers were going to bow down to him, and they didn't take too kindly to that, you know, that uh, prophecy. Uh, eventually, they hated him. His, he was his father's favorite he was his father's favorite son. He had the, the coat of many colors, which was a badge of uh, favor from the father. And essentially, the older brothers probably figured, you know, when, when t- the time came, the old man was probably going to give him all his stuff because he was his favorite. He was the first son of the beloved Rachel. And uh, so he was hated. He, uh, they initially planned to kill him, but uh, Reuben intervened, and instead they sold him into slavery. Of course, we know that he was taken to Egypt and sold into the house of Potiphar that we read about in chapter 39. But in between chapter 37 and chapter 39, there's chapter 38. And we skipped over it last week because it wasn't in context with what we were reading, at least directly. But it is very much in context. Because in chapter 38 is a story, and I'm so amazed, not amazed, but it's just it's just a, a, a a blessing to me as I read through this word, and we've read the story so many times, so many times we've read through it, but every time we read it, there's something new, and, and, and as you read it and study it, it's one thing to read through it, it's another thing to study it, and when you see how God's word is so perfect and so uh, precise in how it lays out God's plan, how, and we've talked about this all through reading these stories about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and so forth. How that despite human frailty, despite the fact that human beings are greedy, avaricious, are mean, are uh, self-centered, uh, and you list all the negative uh, attributes of, of, of a depraved human being like myself or like yourself. Uh, how God can, through all that, weave his plan. How he can use fallen humanity. Throughout all these stories, we read about his mercy. We see his grace. We see his justice. We see his loving kindness. We see his holiness, his righteousness. In Psalm 89, in verse 13, it says this, You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, and high as your right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation of your throne. Mercy and truth shall go before your face. And all through the Old Testament, as we read these stories of fallen humanity trying to work their way through life, sometimes against God's will and sometimes being disobedient, even in spite of that, God is able to weave his plan. God is able to establish his plan. And and something he does, and we've talked about this, and we're going to see this this in this story, that God is faithful, that if you're a servant of God, he will show you yourself in the life of somebody else. I don't know if you all know what I'm talking about. He'll show you, it's like, and I've used this example before, you know, when, I'm, when, we're, when we're sitting in the house, when Rose and I would be sitting in the house or laying in bed, and one of them guys drives by with one of them, you know what I'm talking about? See, it was God was showing me what it was like when me and my friend Wally across the street used to sit on my front porch with an amplifier and an old record player plugged in there and making the drive the neighbors nuts. He was letting me see, okay? He let me see myself and somebody else because if, if I was like I was now, like I was then, I would have a in my car too, okay? Because that's, that's what I did. I look, <laughs> and Carol still do. She's still a troublemaker. Christian music, that's all right. But... I, 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 I can think back to when I first got saved, and then I got involved, I started getting involved in ministry. And I look back 
on those, those times. And, and today, I, I see people doing things that I used to do. And I used to think, I said, poor Pastor Spencer. He had to put up with me. Uh, you know, and that's just the way, you know, God shows you yourself in somebody else. He's faithful to do that. We saw that in Jacob. Uh, when Jacob went to stay with Uncle Laban, uh, he got back, uh, the, the, the term is you get back in spades, which it dealt out, okay? Uh, he got back, he handed back to him what he did. He had to confront who he was in the lives of other people doing that to him. And, and we're going to see a little bit of that in this story uh, that we're going to read tonight. It's the story of Judah, okay? Now, if you remember... Uh, when you think of the sons of Jacob, the four oldest sons, the oldest one was who? Who can remember? The oldest son. They named the sandwich after him. <laughs> okay. Reuben. Okay. okay. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I still haven't lost. Well, maybe I need to lose my sense of humor. But Reuben was the oldest son. He should have been the preeminent one, he should have been the prominent one. He should have been the one who would have gotten, you know, the, the uh, firstborn share. But what did he do? If you remember the story, he slept with one of his fathers. After the death of Rachel, he slept with one of his father's uh, concubines, one of Rachel's handmaidens. And, and when we get to uh, the, uh, chapter 49 of Genesis, when Jacob blesses all his sons, all this stuff comes into perspective because Jacob recounts all these things, okay? So Reuben was kind of set aside because of what he did. The next two sons were who? Anybody know who the second one was? Not yet. Not yet for Judah. Simeon. Simeon was the second one. And the third was, anybody guess? The priestly tribe. Levi. Simeon and Levi. Simeon was next in line and Levi. But what did they do? Remember the story when their sister Dinah was, uh, was raped and taken by this one man who wanted to marry her, and they, you know, they didn't appreciate it, so they ended up killing that family. That's back in chapters 35 or 36, I can't remember. But, so they, were, they had blood on their hands, and Jacob said, you have become, you've made me an offense to the people around here. And, and so they were kind of set aside. So the fourth son was Judah. Okay. You figure he keeps saying Judah, you're going to get it right eventually. <laughs> All right. The fourth son was Judah. So essentially, he was like the next in line. Is The first three kind of got set aside, and he was the next in line. And we think, well, Judah, Jesus, we know that Jesus was the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when we, again, when we get to chapter 49, and you read what Jacob has to say of, of, about Judah, it's, you know, the scepter shall not depart and so forth. Uh, but Judah, he had his problems too. In fact, Judah was the one who recommended that they sell their brother Joseph into slavery. Reuben was the one that kept him from killing him. But Judah said, well, you know, why kill him? Let's just get rid of him this way. It was nice of him. He sold him into slavery. Didn't really understand that everything he was doing, even though it seemed like a horrible thing to do to your brother, it was God weaving his plan in that whole thing. They didn't understand it. They just wanted to get rid of their brother. But it was also Judah, when you go further in the story, if you read on, I think most of us know the story of Genesis and how the, the brothers went down to Egypt because there was a famine in the land and Joseph uh, had, had achieved a place of leadership in Egypt. And they went down there and they didn't recognize him. They thought he was an Egyptian king. And Joseph knew who they were, so he treated them harshly. And he told them, he told them, he says, uh, uh, they brought Benjamin, uh, Joseph's younger son, from Rachel. And Joseph said, well, you know, leave your son here and go back to your homeland. And, and, uh, and you know, just, I want you to leave your son, uh, leave your youngest brother here. And it was Judah that stood up and said, listen, you know, if we leave him here, it's going to break, it's going to kill our father because uh, our, his oldest brother is gone. He didn't realize he was talking to Joseph at the time, but he says his older brother's gone. And if we leave him here, it's going to break our father's heart. Judah offered to be the one to stay instead of Benjamin. So we see some good things in Judah, okay, even in his uh, personality. And, and we'll get there when we get there. But this story uh, that we're going to read in chapter 38 is a, is a little bit of a kind of a strange story, but it's one that's there for a reason. 
We don't read any other stories about any of the other brothers, but we read about Judah. Why? Because way back then, the Holy Spirit knew that Judah would be the tribe from whence would come the blessing to all peoples. So we read this story, and we'll just get into it. Uh, It says in chapter 38 and verse 1, excuse me, And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. Now Judah decided that he was going to branch out a little bit. Uh, This probably happened before the events of chapter 37. We're not given a definite timeline, but the terms, and it came to pass at that time, uh, seems to be kind of a blank slate of when this happened. It, It really would have had to have happened before they sold Joseph into slavery because of, of the time frame of having children and so forth. So uh, this happened like before. Uh, he didn't leave his family completely because he, we know that he kept working with his brothers, with his father's flocks. But he obviously amassed some of his own flocks, and he decided to you know, get, get himself another place. So he didn't go a, a long way. He kind of went down off the hill, uh, met this fellow uh, named Hara, and Judah saw there a certain... Uh, a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in unto her and married her, which was not uh, really the best thing to do because, again, up until this point, they, they were striving to keep the line, the lineage, within the family. So now he went out and he married a Canaanite. And she conceived, and she bore a son and called his name Er, and she conceived again, and bare a son, and he, she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Kezib, where she bare him. Now, just, just for the sake of, you know, understanding this, these names, I always look up what names mean. Uh, I, just, I just feel that names in the, in the Bible sometimes carry with them a, a, a definition, a story. The name Er, E-R, means watchful. The name Onan means strong. The name Sheila means a request. And the name of the city where Sheila was born, Kezit, means a lie. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can maybe make a message out of that, but I, I won't try. Okay. So he, he, had these three, he had these three sons of this Canaanite woman. And it says in verse 6, and Judah took a wife for heir, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Now, we don't know anything about Tamar. We don't know what her lineage was. We don't know if she was uh, of, the, you know, of Abraham or one of, one of his other uh, children. It doesn't really tell us. But he, uh, I, I personally kind of believe that she was, and we're going to see why in a minute, but that's just an opinion. Uh, he took T- uh, Tamar. For Er, and Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. We don't know what he did. We don't know what made him so wicked. Again, people can conjecture about, you know, his attitude toward Tamar, toward his father. It, but we, we don't know. All we know, it says he was wicked. If the Bible says he was wicked, he was wicked. And he was so wicked that the Lord slew him. Well, that's, you know, God, does, God can do things like that. I'm sure Judah wasn't too pleased with that. But it says, And Judah said unto Onan the second, Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. Now here we have what they call a Leverite law. Leverite is Latin for brother-in-law. Okay, And what, what they practiced there, and it was actually a law later on when God gave the law to Moses, he incorporated this into the... the uh, the, the, uh, the law given to Moses. It was also a law that was in some of the, some of the early Mesopotamian societies, uh, Hanarabi, if you've ever studied ancient, uh, ancient history. Hanarabi was one of the early kings of Mesopotamia. He had a law. They found a, they found a rock with all his law written on it. One of the laws was uh, if, a, if, a, if an elder son, if the oldest son married and died without having children, the next youngest brother was required to take that woman and impregnate her and raise up a child with his older brother's name. 
Uh, in the, in, in, we'll read about this when you get, like, get into Ruth. Uh, the kinsman redeemer, okay? Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He's the one that paid the price and bought us back. Uh, Boaz, in the story of Ruth, which is a beautiful story, was the kinsman redeemer. He, he bought back Ruth, whose, uh, whose husband had passed away. So Onan was to be the kinsman redeemer for, uh, for his brother. Well, Onan obviously wasn't too thrilled with that, because it says in verse 9, that Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. We don't have to get graphic. I think we all understand what it's saying there. He, uh, he did not like the fact that he was going to have to have a child, and it wouldn't be his. I mean, it would be gen you know, genetically, but according to the family rules and everything, his son would actually bear his brother's name. He wasn't too thrilled with that. And the thing that he did in verse 10 displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. So here's Judah with three sons. He's only got one left. And to a, to a patriarch of that day, you know, the most important thing was to have a progeny, to have people after you. So he has one son left. So it says here in verse 11, And Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Sheila, my son, be grown. He said, if you wait, as soon as he's old enough, he's next in line. He'll take you and let you have a child, you know, raise up to your first husband. And he says, lest peradventure he die also as his brother did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. What Judah said and what he was thinking was two different things. He was saying... You know, you go and wait for Sheila to get old enough, and he'll be, you know, he'll be your husband. What he was really thinking was, I'm not giving another one, my last son to her, because everyone is like, you know, you remember that song, I'm Henry VIII, I am? <laughs> okay, okay. He, he says, I'm not giving my son to her because the last two got, you know, got killed. I'm not, I'm not risking that, my last son. So Judah had in his mind, you know, I'll just, I'll just send her away, and, uh, you know, maybe she'll forget about it, you know, okay. All right. Verse 12. And in the process of time, we don't know how many years, but it had to have been at least several for Sheila to get old enough. Uh, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. Uh, Judah's wife passed away. Judah was comforted. And he went up unto his sheep shears to Timnath, and uh, he and his friend Hira the Adolamite. So it, was, it came time to shear the sheep. And again, there was a certain place where they would take their sheep and they would be sheared, and, and it was that time of year. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, your father-in-law goes up to Timnath to shear his sheep. Now Tamar finally caught on to the, to the game here. She'd been waiting and waiting and waiting for Judah to fulfill his promise, for Judah to keep his promise to her that she would not be childless, and she would not be without a husband. He owed it to her, according to the law of the land. He owed it to her, but he wasn't paying up. And I'm sure that time for a woman to wear a widow's garments, that was like a reproach. No other man, she couldn't go find another man because she was promised to this, you know, to this youngest son. So she had to wear these widow garments and be looked upon, you know, with, and again, to earn a living back then, they didn't have... They didn't have, you know, SSI. So, I mean, it was, it was very difficult to be a widow at that time in that, in that land. But when she heard that uh, J uh, Judah was on his way up, she put her widow's garments off from her, in verse 14, and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Sheila was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. She said, all right. I'm going to take this into my own hands. Something is wrong here. And when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot. She played the harlot. She sat there. She was dressed like one. And she was sitting in a place where harlots would sit. If, if you read a little bit further, the, the words that they use uh, seem to indicate that she was dressing her, herself as one of the temple prostitutes because the Canaanites... Their part of their worship was sexual immorality. So she was posing as a prostitute. And when he turned unto her, 
uh, verse 15. When Judas saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me that you may come in unto me? Now, see, he was propositioning her. Okay. I mean... I hate to say it, but it's like some of the girls down on Constitution Boulevard and they need a viaduct, man. They're, that's, they're, wait, you know, they're waiting. And here he comes. And Judah, he's, you know, his wife is dead. Uh, and, you know, he sees this prostitute and he's up. He's going up to the sheep shears, which was a big party time. When they would shear the sheep, they would celebrate. So he was in that kind of mood, right? So he said, how much? And he said, I'll send you a kid from the flock. And she said, will you give me a pledge till you send it? He says, I'll send you a sheep. I'll pay you with, with a sheep from the flock. I don't have one here, but I'll get you one. And she says, well, you know, why should I trust you? And he said, what pledge shall I give you? And she said, your signet, you know, his ring with the signet on it, and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in your hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. She became pregnant by Judah. Okay. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil, laid uh, by her veil from her, and put on the garments of her widowhood again. So Judah went up to the shearing, and when he came back, verse 20, Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adolamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he could not find her. And he asked of the men of that place, saying, Where is the, the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot here. And he returned to Judah and said, I can't find her. And also the men of that place said, There wasn't even a harlot there. And Judah said, Well, I tried. I tried. Don't know where she is. Maybe I'll see her someday. And uh, we'll see what happens. So Judah's figuring that's okay. He's, you know. Look at verse 24. And it came to pass about three months later. Now, now this, is, this is something that, that kind of jumped out at me, reading this story. Judah was deceived by a woman that was veiled. Remember who his mother was? Leah. Remember what Leah did at the behest of her father Laban? She deceived Jacob with a veil. In a soft voice. It came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar thy daughter-in-law has played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Light her up. Again, that was the penalty, that was the, the, the civil penalty for adultery. She was promised to his youngest. He, he didn't intend to give his youngest son to her anyhow, but he figured, well, this is going to take care of this problem. He said, bring her here. We'll take her to court. And she'll be found guilty. Can't deny that she's pregnant. We'll burn her. Burn her to stake. Judah didn't realize that it was his own deception that got him to that place where he was right now. See, remember, remember, I, I was think everything we're reading in the Old Testament brings me back to that scripture in Romans that says all things work together for the good. <laughs> even deception, even deceit, God, listen, when God's justice, God will be just. He will not allow People like, you know, Tamar was being ripped off. She was being deceived. She was being used. She was, she was set aside like a nobody. God will bring justice. His righteousness, his holiness will be manifested. He's not going to let anybody ultimately get away with anything. Maybe for a while. But it always comes home. It's always going to come home to roost. It's always going to come home. When she was brought forth, in verse 25, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, Hey, Judah, recognize this? Signet ring? 
It's got your signet. It's got your, your sign on it. Remember this, Judah, this staff? How about these bracelets you had on? She says, By the man whose these things are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these, the signet, the bracelet, and the staff? Red-handed. Caught dead to rights. Couldn't deny. Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I. When you read commentators on this passage, some will make Tamar out to be a saint. Some will make her out to be a lying, thieving. <laughs> but she, she was just a woman who wanted what was rightfully hers. She was just a woman who wanted what was right. Judah said, he acknowledged and said, you are more righteous than I, because that I gave you not to Shiloh, my son, and he knew her again no more. Verse 27. Now here we come to the culmination. Here we come to the, to the end of, the, of this story. And next week we'll get back to Joseph and, and back to Joseph in Egypt. But here we come to the end of the story. God's plan being woven through all this stuff, all this lying and all this deceit and all this adultery and all this fornication and all this stuff going on. Somebody say, man, can't, couldn't God find a better way to do it? Well, I might be able to think of another way to do it. But it wouldn't be a better way. It kind of reminds me of that scripture that's in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul says this, We have this treasure in earthen vessels. You know, I think God loves to get glory out of stories like this. He doesn't like when people sin. He doesn't like when people deceive each other. But he loves to get glory when he can take failing human beings and show his grace and show his mercy and show his loving kindness and show his retribution and show his, his justice and through it all accomplish what he means to accomplish. He can take people like us and I've, I've, I have sure have done enough since I've been in ministry that God would have been justified in saying, get out, go do something else. But yet he's been faithful and he's been just and he's been holy. See, like I said, this came back in Judah's face, right? His, what he tried to do was brought right back in front of him. And I've, I've said this before when we were talking about Jacob. If you want to work for the Lord, he's going to show you those things about yourself that you need to deal with. And he'll do it in the life of somebody else. He'll put it right in front of your face. Right there. He will. And all we can say is, <laughs> you're more righteous than I am. Listen to the end of the story. Verse 27. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, Twins were in her womb. Man, we all was reading about these twins. And it came to pass when she travailed that one put out his hand. The midwives were there. And the first thing that came out was a hand. Okay. And the one midwife got a, a piece of red thread and tied it around the hand. She said, that's, that's the firstborn. Well, it says... When she travailed, one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth this breach upon thee? Therefore his name is called Pharez, which means breaking the breach. Again, we see twins. The younger being favored 
over the older, because we'll see in a minute. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. So we see Judah, the line of Judah. We don't hear anything more about Shelah, his youngest son, up to that time. But these two, Perez and Zerah, we read about them again. You know where we read about them again? All the way over in Matthew chapter 1. All the way over in Matthew chapter 1. When I, when I first, the first time I sat down, when I first got saved, I figured I got to start reading the Bible. And I picked up the New Testament and started reading Matthew, and what I got was a bunch of begats that I didn't understand anything about. I said, ah, oh, begat, 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 begat. When do we get to the manger thing, you know? But the, the, the begats are there for a reason. There's, there's a list here, and there's a list over in Luke. The list in Luke and the list here are a little different. Because some people believe that one is, is the, the, uh, the genealogy of Joseph, who is the legal father of Jesus, even though not the literal father. And in Luke, it's the, the genealogy of, of uh, Mary. Okay, that's, that's another message. But this genealogy is given here because for Jesus to have made a claim to be the Messiah, he had to prove his lineage. He had to prove where he came from. That's why they kept genealogies. All through the Bible, in the Old Testament, you see all kinds of places where there are genealogies. So-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. I, I don't think I have ever fully read through the first nine chapters of First Chronicles. Because it's just begat, 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 begat. You know, and there are probably some messages in there somewhere if you really, you know, if you really pray about it and read there. But, you know, when I, get to, when I do my, like, reading and I get to First Chronicles, I kind of skim through. Okay. Come on, be honest. You do something. Okay. But they're there for a reason. Because, you know, property rights, uh, you know, the, 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 the land was divided amongst the, the tribes. They had to prove where they came from. So this is a genealogy, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus' lineage, his claim to Messiahship rests upon this genealogy. One of the most important parts of the Bible, even though it's probably one of the least read. In this genealogy, in most genealogies that you'll read in the Old Testament, they have the father, the father, the father, the father, the father, the father. The father. But in this genealogy, there are four women. Four women. One of them is Bathsheba. We know the story of Bathsheba. King David committed adultery with Bathsheba, murdered her husband. Solomon was her son. Another one was Ruth, who was a Moabite. Moabites were a cursed people. Another one was Rahab, who was a harlot from Jericho. She was a harlot from Jericho, but she had enough faith in God that she harbored the spies. She put her life on the line because she knew that their God was going to wipe that city out. But the first one, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brethren. doesn't mention all the other ones. Verse 3, and Judah begat who? Pharez and Zerah. Both are included. Of Tamar, of this woman who was wronged, who played a harlot, who deceived Judah into doing what he should have done, to, who deceived him into doing what was right, to give her what was rightfully hers according to the law. Did God approve of what she did? Well, I, I, you, know, I, you have to ask him. But he used it. She was only claiming what was rightfully hers. 
and she made the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Judah begat Pharez and Zerah of Tamar, and Pharez begat Esram, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. So in this story about Joseph, right in the middle, we see this little parentheses. A story of God's grace, his mercy, his righteousness, his justice, his judgment, that we see throughout the stories of the Old Testament. I thank God. You know, these people that, we're that we've read about and that we're reading about were in the flesh. Yes. They acted in the flesh. They didn't have the law of Moses. They, it was before the law was given. It, it was before they were a nation. They were a family. And there were civil laws, again, at that time. There were laws amongst the people who lived there. But they were, they were operating in the flesh. They knew there was a God. God revealed himself to their father, Jacob. But I thank God that God reveals himself even through our mistakes. It took another 20 five years or so before they finally realized the plan of God for them. All this stuff was going on. Judah had no clue that one day he would be begging his brother Joseph that he thought was dead, sold into slavery, begging his brother Joseph to, to spare the life of, of his, his younger brother Benjamin that he would, he would be a surety for them. He, he had no clue that that was going to happen. He had no clue that that through this, the, the birth of this child from, these, uh, from this woman that deceived him would come the promise of Jehovah to a lost and dying world. And I think sometimes, do we realize what God has in store for us? Do we realize the, the, the choices we've made? And I think back in my life, I'm sure you could think back in yours. There have been choices I have made that have not been the right choices. I have made mistakes in my life since being a Christian. I'm not counting about before. I made a few back then, too. But since becoming a Christian, there are things I've done and things I've said and choices I've made that I look back on and I say, I wish I could have that over again. But I thank God that even though I've been, there are consequences, even though there's God showing us his justice and his righteousness right in front of us. Even though all that, I thank God for his mercy. I thank God for his grace. I thank God for his forgiveness. I thank God for his righteousness, for his holiness. I thank God that he'll take anything I've ever done, whether good or bad, and he'll turn it for my good and his good. That's what his promise is. We have this treasure in earth and vessels. I'm not saying you should go out and think, well, gee, what kind of mistake can I make tonight that God can use? <laughs> we want to we we be, you know, we want to be, we want to listen to God. I mean, have, have you ever done something? And, and you say, Man, I thought I heard from God. And you look around and you say, God, was that you? His mercy, his grace, his righteousness, his holiness. His justice. He's right all the time. I think about Joseph when he was sitting in that prison thinking, what am I doing here? Joseph was thrown in prison for doing something that was right. Did he know what was going to happen in another five years or ten years that he was going to be the second in command? He didn't know that. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know how God's going to take the things that we've done and said and the mistakes that we've made. We don't know how he's going to take them, but we know that he will take them. Yes. And he'll work all things yes. together yes. for the good of them that love him, that are called according to his purpose, to conform us to the image. 
He wants to make us look like Jesus. I say that all the time. That all these things, he'll take our mistakes, he'll take our good choices, our bad choices, whatever they might be, he'll take them and he'll make us look like Jesus if we'll let him. That's what he did here. Amen? Amen. Anybody have any questions or comments or anything you'd like to add? Kind of a short, short-winded tonight. Anything at all? Yes, Donna. He can do it. He can do it. I can't tell you how many people I see, you know, when I go down to like Westmore County, guys in jail. How many of those guys will say, I'm glad I'm here? Say, I'm glad I'm here. So if I wasn't here, I'd be dead. Now, some of them guys, when they get out, they forget that. It takes another time around <laughs> for them to finally learn, you know. We never know. I know I've used the example before. David Berkowitz, son of Sam, remember him? Back in, I forget what years it was, when he was, he was shooting people, killing people in New York. Demon-possessed. Demon, I mean, by his own, demon-possessed. He got life in prison in New York State. Every time he comes up for parole, he says, I don't want it. Because he got saved. And God uses him in that prison. Whenever he comes up for parole, he doesn't even, he doesn't even apply for it. He doesn't go for it. He says, I don't, want, I don't want to get out. I'm where God wants me to be. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't happy that he killed people. But God took something that horrible and used it for his good. We have this treasure in earth and vessels. That the excellency of the power may be his and not ours. So I believe, and I'll say this and I'm going to close, that whatever mistakes you have made, sometimes we make mistakes and we'll think, oh, that's it. I'm done. God will never fix this. Listen, I don't care what you've done. I don't care the mistakes you've made. I don't care the wrong turns you've made. If we come to the Lord and we ask him, he'll take those things. And, we, and if we come to him and we repent, okay. Judah repented when he got faced, when he seen that signet and that staff and those bracelets. He said, well. if we repent, he'll take those mistakes and he'll do whatever he has to do to get the glory. I want to pray tonight. If you're here tonight and you're thinking, man, I've, I've done some things that God could never, God could never fix. I want to tell you, to, God can fix anything. It might take a while. There might be some consequences. There might be some, some bumps in the road along the way, but God can fix anything. Usually, if he's going to fix it, he, you're going to face it. <laughs> Before he can fix it, you've got to face it. Just like Judah had to. And sometimes we get afraid to face it. But you know what? Don't be afraid to face it. Don't be afraid to look at it. That's the only way you're going to get past it. If you face it. Father, there are things that we've got to come face to face to. And Lord, it seems, I know some of us, we might feel, I, I don't want to look at that again. I don't want to, I just want to get it out of my mind. But Father, sometimes, and I pray, Lord, you know each and every person in this place a whole lot better than I do. God, whatever we have to face, remnants of our past, ways that you're reminding us of what we used to be. God, I pray that you will help us, each and every one of us, look that thing right in the eye, face to face, and say, okay, that was me. Now, God, what are you gonna, how are you going to get the glory out of this? God, how are you going to get the glory? How are you going to be exalted? How is, how is the excellency of the power going to be made manifest through this broken vessel? Father, I pray that as we look these things square in the face, you'll help us stand and believe your word. When you say all things work together for the good, you mean it. 
when you say they all work together for the good to conform us to your image father you mean it god we lay it out to you this evening those things that we think can never be fixed those things that we think can never be forgiven lord we bring them to you tonight. if there's those things in your past where you think god can never repair believe me god can fix it and use it for his glory amen Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word tonight.